Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Now you can apply this plastic, but you can also apply it to content. That's what content repurposing is all about. That's when you recycle one piece of content, let's say a blog post, and turn it into other formats like infographics or a podcast or even a video. And the benefits to this is that it's so much easier to create content and scale it. In other words, you don't have to write every post or shoot every video or design every infographic from scratch. You have this core element or content that you can use for those other three types. And the person who loves talking about this is Justin Simon. He is a content strategy consultant and the host of the Distribution First show. Eats, sleeps, and dreams about content repurposing all day. In this Marketing Pops episode, you learn first why content distribution is so important to every content strategy. Second, the benefits of considering distribution first. Third, Justin's 3C content strategy. And number four, how diversification has helped accelerate Justin's content career. Before we get started, I've created a free power-up cheat sheet that you can download, fill in, and apply Justin's 3C content strategy right now. You can go to marketingpowerups.com or find those links in the show notes and description. Are you ready? Let's go. Marketing power-ups. Ready? Go! Here's your host. Rambly John! Let's talk about marketing power-ups, particularly about content distribution. Now, I know why it's so important, but like you've kind of really niched down on this topic. Why is it so important to you and why should it be so important to to marketing marketing teams that they should be considering or, uh, um, content distribution first, like with your, pod, your, your podcast show, which I'll link in the, in the show notes for sure. Yeah, uh, for me, it's honestly come out of out of a decade of experience doing content and running content teams, doing content as a solo marketer, and doing that in a bunch of different ways. And really, the transition for me was when I was went from being kind of an individual contributor, like writer, to running a team and being you know tracking metrics and understanding what's working and what what's not working and how to be responsible for a team. And not only responsible for, you know, what we were uh, outputting, but responsible for the work they were doing and how they did in their career. So I felt a very like strong weight to um, be a good manager and be a good uh, kind of steward of their time and what they were working on. And what I realized was we were creating gobs of content uh, to, <laughs> too, oh, you know, really too much content oh, without no. a real plan of like, okay, how, how is our audience seeing this? How how are we going to get that in front of our audience, whether that's organic or paid? And what what I realized at, at the end of the day was we were most likely creating more content than our distribution channels could even manage. So like we had more, co- like if you think about, I, I use this analogy on one of my shows, but it, it, I'm going to flip it and use it in a different way. If you think about it kind of like lanes, car lanes, like we only had four car lanes, but we had a massive traffic jam of content that just kept getting loaded every single week with more stuff. And we only had, you know, X mm. amount of social channels, email. And so then you end up fighting over who sends this email on this day or who, you know, oh, we've got like six things we want to communicate. How do we not spam people? And it just becomes this whole thing. And so that's where I think marketing teams can really like using distribution first and the methodology that I talk about and help help companies implement is really focusing on where are you getting your content in front of your audience and then reverse engineering what you actually need from there. Because most of the times with the companies that I end up working with, they're like, oh, we're we're creating way too much stuff mm. because it's just the habit of production. Right. And that that what you just described sounds like a whole like thing that I've heard, the content hamster wheel. <laughs> You're really just like, let's produce more. Let's produce more. And typically the reason why they're trying to produce more is like, oh, Google Google would love, would, you know, search engines would love if you publish every day. But the problem with that is like you produce, you often when there's a high output, what it's produced is like subpar, like B plus mm-hmm. content rather than what you're probably thinking about is like A plus and then distributing it. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Like you're you're that's how you're thinking about it. Yeah, totally. And I I came like I sort of cut my teeth in content marketing on the SEO side, like really like so that was the mentality. It was like let's create two blog posts a week. You know, we're doing eight a month. We're putting out all these things. 
We're trying to work with these writers. Eight, I mean, that's a lot of content that you're coming through, especially when we're talking about a thousand to two thousand words and you're expected to kind of manage all that. On the back end of that, which people don't ever think about too, is the long term management of that content once you build that library up to constantly keep it fresh and keep it relevant and keep it new. Um, and so you're not only creating that content uh, originally, but then you have to manage it. And mm. yes, I have, I have a thousand percent been on the hamster wheel, a thousand percent, uh, you know, burned out trying to constantly keep up and create and do all these things. And sometimes too, it's funny, both for me and other like people I've talked to, other VPs at, at different companies, they recognize it too. When they go back and audit their website content, they realize, oh, we posted roughly the same piece of content like it's almost identical just a slight twist like this year last year and the year before mm, and so you so just end up duplicating all these it's like right. it, it's just duplicate effort when when it really doesn't have to be there that's that's so true i think that's a really good point i think you've started to break down like what are the benefits of contribute uh, content distribution thinking about that first you know i'm i'm fully in but for people who are still like you know Justin, rally like we don't really need to talk but think about you know like let's just produce content can you break down like like just a few benefits of thinking about content distribution first like you're thinking about uh yeah you've already mentioned a few but like if you can just listen list it down uh at this moment yeah i mean at, at the start i think most most teams uh get excited about getting more out of less so that's where distribution can help because you can right. create less, but you can still make a really big impact because you can take the things that you are creating and get them out in front of your audience more often. The other benefit with that is if you get the message right in that piece of content, let's say you create a really good, solid piece of content that fits your audience. What happens most of the time when distribution isn't thought of first is you hit publish you maybe, maybe talk about it for a week on social media and maybe send one email and then you mm -hmm. never talk about it again. And I've seen this cycle. I've I dealt with this cycle and I see this cycle all the time with different companies. And it's, it's, that's how that hamster wheel starts. And so what it allows you to do is not only get those messages out, but help your audience be able to understand what those messages are that you want to say over and over again. Cause it's like, how, we want our, you know, we want our audience to know what we care about and how how we can help them and what that looks like. Well, if you spend the time creating a really good piece of content that's thought leadership or something else that's like your take in the marketplace, and you only share it once, and then only a subset, maybe max twenty percent, max is going to see that. So you have eighty percent of your audience that's never seen it, yeah. and even of even of those twenty percent that saw it, they need to see it seven or eight times before it even starts to click. And so that's why I, I always say, like, by the time you're getting bored of your content or your message, your audience is just catching on. And, and that's what I always say. And so I think like that's another core benefit of distribution is being able to get your messages out um, in in like a continuous fashion that actually helps them start to memorize what you do. Before I continue, I want to thank the sponsor for this episode 42 Agency. Now, when you're in scale-up growth mode and you have to hit your KPIs, the pressure is on to deliver demos and signups, and it's a lot to handle. There's demand gen, email sequences, rev ops, and more. And that's where 42 Agency, founded by my good friend Camille Rexton, can help you. They're a strategic partner that's helped B2B SaaS companies like ProfitWall, Teamwork, Sprout Social, and HubDoc to build a predictable revenue engine. If you're looking for performance experts and creatives to solve your marketing growth problems today and help you build the foundations for the future, look no further. Visit 42agency.com to talk to a strategist right now to learn how you can build a high efficiency revenue engine or you can also find that link in the show notes and description well that's it for now let's get back to the episode you know that brings up this uh i forget if it's an education rule or like you're trying to teach something to somebody you got to repeat it like three or four times before it actually starts to uh ingrain in them whether that's you know physics or english or something like that and it's really about this you're like kind of getting people to consume it in many different ways so that they really get the message that you have, which totally makes sense. And I, I love that. And part of all of this, what you're talking about is you've created this three, three C content strategy kind of helps you, um, map out, uh, you know, a content calendar so that you, you know, with a 
great piece of content. You can repurpose it in many ways. Can you talk about uh, this 3C? Uh, what What is it and how can it help te- marketing teams and, and content teams produce a content calendar uh, going forward? Yeah, absolutely. The The 3C method is, it's not all that different from other things that have been talked about. It's just a, a different way to kind of reframe it. How I think about it is, at the top of, if you think about a pyramid, at the top of the pyramid, you have this core piece of content. It's something you're not going to do a ton because it's super in depth. Mm-hmm. And most companies do this type of content, whether it's original research, whether it's sort of the classic uh, ebook or gated piece of these things that they're trying to do maybe once a quarter, a few times a quarter, um, really like cornerstone pieces of content um, at the top. And then from there, it's core content. So a layer underneath. And those are the more of the like monthly, weekly rhythm things. So you could think about like blog posts or podcast episodes or webinars, just these kind of more generalized pieces of content that we're creating. And then underneath that is cut content, which are all of those micro pieces of content, social content, emails, et cetera. And how I like to think about using this uh, is, like you said, to build out a, a content calendar And what it allows you to do is start at the top. So if you have a piece of original research and you're starting to outline that, before you even send that out to the editor, you can understand, oh, this topic Mm. could go more in depth on. And the format of that could be a podcast episode because we have this podcast or it could be a blog or it could be a framework. It's just like I kind of talk about like putting on x-ray vision goggles and being able to see what are those things that can come out of that. And again, that can start in the outline phase to know what those things are you want to do. This is something I did at TechSmith when we did original research. This is something I did at Metadata when we had original research. And it's just being able to take that stuff. And the reason you want to take it from cornerstone to core is because honestly, it gives you, and then to cut, is it gives you an excuse to then get that back out to your audience in a different way. And so... It's not just, hey, did you see our original research report on X, Y, and Z? It's, oh, hey, we, we're we doing a webinar where we're breaking down the exact numbers of how to do blah, 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 blah. And it's just like coming up with a new way to frame that out. And then obviously, once you have a podcast, you can cut the clips off of it. Once you have a blog post, you can take things out of the blog mm-hmm. and, and share those out on social. Same with a webinar. And so being able to take those things and, and build them out that way. What I love about this is that it seems like it's broken down by like level of uh, available time. So like cut, like it will be somebody who's really impatient. They only have maybe 30 seconds and one minute. So like let them get drawn into the the very cornerstone content that you have by bringing them something short, short form. Same with core, you know, an episode is a podcast episode could be shorter or a little long, but uh, a cornerstone content might take some time to really digest. So mm, I guess mm-hmm. if you think about it like a menu, like the the cut is like the appetizer. <laughs> the core, yeah, is uh it, the core sort of is the main dish, and then the core. Uh, I'm I'm messing this up, but I hope people I hope people get it when they're hearing this. Where you're kind of drawing them to this cornerstone piece. It is almost like a a web that you know trying to draw them into the center, the cornerstone yeah. section. And I think the other thing too that, and this is a different way to think about content marketing because I think, and I think smart marketers are starting to think this way, whereas traditionally we gated those eBooks or we gated that research because we wanted to keep it closed off and we wanted to somehow use that email address to then nurture. Whereas how I like to think about it is using those cut pieces of content to do the nurturing for you. So I don't Mm. like... I don't necessarily care if somebody even reads the entire report, if they got value out of that right. one stat that came from our report, and then they get another value out of the blog post that they read, you know, three months down the road and they get more value from, you mm. know, so it's like creating this web of content and properly distributing that out. So where, again, I don't have to necessarily be concerned that somebody is hitting the post because by repurposing that content properly, I know I'm going to get coverage across the distribution channels right. that I put that on so I can get eyeballs on the message that I want to share. I can become known as the authority in that space because they can see that, oh, they're, man, they're talking about their original research, 
you know, that they do the survey that, that they post it all the time. They, they have the information on this yeah. uh, and you start to become an authority in that space that way. And the other thing, uh, I totally, I love that. The other thing is like each, each might be targeting different, like an audience per se, like somebody who is like into research might be more analytical part of your audience and somebody who's YouTube shorts might be a short attention span versus somebody who listens to podcasts uh, might listen to it at the gym and you're like kind of, you're talking about this coverage, but you're also covering like the different ways people want to consume their content. So it's it's actually right. really catering to your audience so that, you know, some people like to read, some people like to watch videos, some people like to listen to podcasts and you're really like catering to how they want to consume that piece of content rather than making it one size fits all essentially. Yeah. Totally. And and the thing I love about the 3C content method is traditionally you do think about it going like top down, but I also love using the 3C content method to go bottom up. Mm, so using social content as validation to then create your bigger pieces of content. Right. And a great example of this is um, I think in December I had this social post that I, I was like, okay, if I were to do a content strategy in 2023, here's what I do. I'd start a show. I do this, I do that. And I broke it all down into seven steps. Did very, very well on LinkedIn. And I was like, oh, that's kind of an interesting topic. Like clearly people are interested, interested in that. So from there, I took that topic and broke it down one by one in my newsletter. And so I talked about it on my newsletter. And then later in the year, when I started the podcast, I took that newsletter and I repurpose that into a podcast and, mm. be able, and use that as the basis of the outline for the show and talk through each and everything. So it's like you can go, you can go top bottom and be able to work that up from like getting social validation that this is something your audience is already interested in and then just expand on it from there. Interesting. What I'm hearing is like it's almost like testing out the piece. Of, this is, it's almost like a min minimum viable content to make sure that it resonates with your audience first before you know, producing a podcast episode, it takes more work than this yes. writing a piece of LinkedIn post. And you're like validating that, yes, this is something that my audience would uh, find valuable. So that's essentially what you're you're talking about there. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Take Use, use your social channels, use email, use these other things that you can kind of grab some validation, even if it's around a core idea. It doesn't have to be sort of like broken out like I had it there, but just like, Man, every time, this is how, honestly, this is how a lot of the distribution and repurposing stuff started for me to talk about it. Because every time I would talk about it, people would be interested in like, oh, that's, nobody's really talking about this. And so it was like, I just start, you know, naturally just started to work my way down that path and be able to really dive in and, and understand how I was doing that and just share out um, kind of the results I was seeing. Makes sense. In, in terms of frequency, how would you suggest that for a content or a marketing team? Like, I'm guessing that those uh, cornerstone ones would be less frequent than cuts. Is there any time frame suggestion you would have or like, you know, once a quarter you'll have a cornerstone or, or some kind of like rule of thumb or it might also depend on a case to case basis as well. Yeah, I, I roughly, I like to say like once a quarter, I think more realistically for companies, honestly, they probably could get by with like twice a year if they did mm. one really big thing in the spring, one really big thing in the fall, they could probably get by with that. Um, if they were cutting it up, because what I like to do too, when I sit down and work with a work with a team, I like to look at and start with their distribution channels to even understand, um, uh, like how many how many lanes of the highway do you have? Like, what do you what are you actively doing right now? Right? Because what I don't want to do is uh necessarily just say, hey, we've got to produce a new cornerstone piece of content every quarter, and then again, not have enough distribution to even get that out. Uh, in, in front of the audience. So I like to work with teams and understand how they're posting, what they're what they're working on, how are, how are they uh, interacting with their audience, and then from there, being able to go from there. But I think for most teams, you could probably get by with, like I said, once or, once or twice a year on a cornerstone piece. And then if you're breaking those out into kind of weekly blog posts or what those rhythms are, um, and then daily social and things like that, you can start to see how those cuts actually transform into each other mm. totally love that i think you mentioned that there where you you mentioned something interesting there around like trying to figure out like what are the channels that a team has first 
one of the problems I have is I often want to do all of them. And, and then you're, I'm looking at your three C's like, yes, I want to do original research. I want to do podcasts. I want to do YouTube videos. I want to do YouTube shorts, videos, emails, everything. But you're saying, hey, let's figure that out first before we get into all this. What do you, what, you have any tips there or like what would be your advice uh, for figuring out which of those uh, channels you want to pursue with a team that you're working with? Yeah, I think it's some of its competency and like um, some of its competency, some of its passion. So like, for instance, YouTube's an easy one, right? Like if you don't have anybody who really like is passionate or knows video or YouTube or search, like maybe don't bother with that at this point because you don't mm -hmm. have anybody that's really um, going to be able to necessarily figure that out unless there is somebody on your team who wants to manage that. On the flip side, something like LinkedIn is a little bit more like low barrier to entry in terms of it's not Twitter. You don't need to support a feed all day long and, and you know, tweet 10 times a day to, to keep up in the feed. If you post once, it'll kind of like carry out and that's more about networking. And so for me, I think it's it's trying to figure out what capacity you have as far as people who can actually own it. And then I always say start with one. I mean, it's the most common advice, but pick one and get really good at one because the things you learn on Twitter will probably transfer over in some way, shape or form over to LinkedIn. And honestly, right. those things can transfer over into YouTube and podcasting too, because the same elements you need to write a really good hook are not all that different than the same elements you need to write a really good title or, you know, come up with topics and things to create. And so once you get into that rhythm of being able to to do something really, really well. I mean, I would rather have a solid audience on one platform than have bad audiences across <laughs> several. You know what I mean? Or, or and I think that yeah. there's just opportunity cost of doing all those things. So, you know, like going and audit uh, a company's social, and you'll see, well, they are posting on Instagram, but it's two likes for for every posts they're not really getting any traction they haven't really gained any subscriber or followers in the last couple of years but they still have to focus on that every week they they have a line item in their checklist of of getting something out on instagram or facebook or i mean there's still companies who do like organic facebook and like right. like no traffic no reach but they're still spending time trying to figure that out whereas if you didn't spend your time doing that you could maybe go all in on a different channel like email or True. or just something else that, that might be more productive. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Something that I'm considering for my own work, uh, for sure. Just something that hit me uh, right now, because I've been seeing it on Twitter a lot around like AI. I'm curious what your thoughts are on how AI can help with distribution, uh, especially with you know, repurposing stuff where mm -hmm. maybe you can plug in a blog post and ask chat GPT to, have you ever done that? I'm curious. <laughs> I, I <laughs> write I've a LinkedIn post for this yeah. blog post. <laughs> I've, I've monkeyed with it. It's what I'm learning with, uh, with chat GPT is it's all about the prompt. It's all about getting the, you know, you setting it up for success. Um, just, just saying, write me a, a LinkedIn post is not going to be great. Um, <laughs> I think in the future, there's potential for as more of these frameworks come out and be able to build those frameworks into the tool or use particular frameworks into the tool and teach the AI, how, hey, when I say I want this turned into a zero click piece of content that is starts with a really good hook and, and this is what a really good hook is, but you have to like work it down that path to get it to be smart enough to do okay. some of that. I like it for take a look at this blog post and pull out the top Interesting. Um, points, points out of this post or I like that. take a look at this transcript and give me the subtopics that are in it. Or, mm. you know, I like to use it for ideation to understand like, yeah. and, 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 and that's how some of that can come up because that's how I then get more core pieces of content or more cut pieces of content to be able to come up with something interesting to write on. That makes sense. I was just, I was just curious because uh, uh, I'm seeing people using it for, you know, creating creating outlines or like, you know, just creating a rough, uh, rough draft with that. I'm curious. You already gave an example of that three C method uh, earlier with your LinkedIn post. Is there any other example that you you've used this this uh, methodology um, to to 
you know, in the in the real world that you you can share yeah. with the audience. For sure, yeah. When uh, I mean, when I was at TechSmith, we did this for we did a view, video viewer study that essentially. So TechSmith, we made um, video editing software, and so we did a video. We d- we just did a survey, uh, surveyed an audience, surveyed our audience, and got their video viewing habits. So what you know, things like what made you stop watching a video, what things made you really interested in watching a video, and just broke all these things down. Took that data, had a huge you know professional subset of folks look at it and build out that that content. But once we had the content back, then what I did, I literally have it in a notebook somewhere. It's probably over my bookshelf where I went through it and wrote down all of the interesting like headlines out of it. Mm. And so it was like, you know, why people stop watching video. That's interesting. Um, You know, the five, you know, five things you need for video SEO. That's kind of interesting. Like just kind of taking out the different pieces and then from there, we created a ton of blog posts off of that content, and we created podcast episodes that broke down those kinds. So, like, we might have the data, but then we would take that and create a podcast episode where we're breaking down the data and talking about it and having a conversation about it. Um, or we would take it and have a webinar where it was a standalone thing, and we were just going to talk about one of those things. So, that's that's probably the best example of taking a cornerstone piece of content and breaking it out in that way. And that's the thing too, with like, I think sometimes when people talk about distribution or, or distribution in this way, it can be like SEO isn't really thought of, but mm. SEO, SEO, Google is just a distribution channel. Mm. And right. so, so if you think about Google as just another distribution channel, you can use SEO to your advantage, like SEO can still be to the advantage. So when we're creating these topics and coming up with those topics, it's pulling out maybe the interesting headlines, but then going back and saying like, is anybody searching around this topic? Oh, right. okay, they are. So let's use our data to then support that topic and start to rank for those things. Uh, you know, what makes a good YouTube thumbnail? We now have, you know, based on our survey, six criteria that makes a good YouTube thumbnail that we can talk. You know, so it's like you can come up with those right. type of topics that pull off of that. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, you brought it up. What is the six? What's the YouTube YouTube oh, I don't know. It's been it's been years. It's been years, and I'm sure and I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure joking. they've changed at this point. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, I was just super curious uh, about that. I'm trying to get into doing more YouTube videos, but like that's super super interesting. Thanks for sharing that. I really do uh, appreciate you sharing about this 3C methodology that you you've been working on. I want to shift gears now and talk about career power ups. You've been in marketing, content marketing now for over a decade. I'm curious. What's really helped you accelerate your career? Um, you know, now you're doing your own um, your own thing. What What are some things that helped you um, throughout your career? Yeah, I think the biggest thing early in my career was uh, being able to be a junior kind of content person and do a whole bunch of different things. And so I got to write emails, I got to write web copy, I got to build web pages. Uh, I got to write ad copy. So I got to do a whole bunch of different aspects and content and honestly got to do that for years before I started narrowing down and really kind of niching down into what I wanted to do. Uh, So I think being more broad Mm. early on to know that even if you're not the one that has to do it to understand, okay, and be able to have that conversation with your paid ads expert to say, okay, how are we going to work together? You know, as a demand, you know, demand gen and content, how are we going to work together to to really run a a really efficient uh, marketing program? Or how are am I going to work with devs to cr- get the website to be created and graphics and all the type of things? So, like, really being able to be multifaceted in that way, and then a level up from there, which has helped me to kind of start my own business, is understanding larger facets of the organization besides just marketing. Mm. Um, because that's, <laughs> that's one of those areas where it's really easy to only understand what your niche is and, and what your area is and why that matters. But unless you understand why the product team cares about X, Y, and Z thing and how you can help them, or what does the CFO care about, or how does right. sales use this stuff that you're working with and being able to communicate with all of those different people. Uh, it's going to re- be really hard for you to make traction and and help grow the org. That makes sense. Get it. I forgot who mentioned it. I think it was April Dunford who mentioned it to me. Like, 
one of her career power-ups is like, you know, stop thinking, you know, thinking about marketing beyond it, like thinking about it in the market and then making sure that you're seeing how it's affecting other teams. Really love that. Uh, one final question, you know, in terms of if, if you can travel back in time, send a message through time to the younger version of Justin. I, I, I love this question. It's like time travel. Like what is this now sci-fi? But what would be a piece of advice that you would share that younger version of, of Justin who might be just starting mm. out in marketing, not even maybe sure about like what uh, he wants to do at, at that moment? I would tell younger me to stay curious and take learning into your own hands. Mm -hmm. So don't rely on the company to get you where you want to be or the work you're doing at the company to get you where you want to be. You have to go out on your own and learn those things. Um, and that's how that it took me a long time to kind of realize that. Um, but as soon as I started to kind of take my career and in, in, in my uh, sort of growth plan into my own hands, I was able to really learn and grow at a 10x rate because I could watch, you know, a series of YouTube videos and start implementing That's that true. on something or I could read a, a blog post and try to implement that. I remember one time I was listening to a podcast coming into work uh, about how to like get in a, a featured snippet in Google at the time. This is like 2016. And I came into work and I implemented it. And then by lunchtime, I was able to show our VP like, hey, look, we uh, we now own this snippet. And she was like, how did you do that? And I was like, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, funny thing. I was just listening to this podcast on the way into work and then, you know, just tried to implement it. So I think like taking those things in your hand, being curious, like and, and trying to learn the new aspects of, of marketing, new aspects of the business. Like I think just being never ending curiosity is, is mm. probably the biggest lesson that I would tell myself. I totally, totally love that. Uh, especially that story you just shared. You come into work and, you know, uh, you, you know, on a future snippet. That's really, really uh, cool. In terms of like, um, you said you listen to that podcast. Like, where else do you like listening, uh, learning about marketing? Like, um, newsletters, podcasts, videos. Like, what are some things that you're learning more about marketing these days? I think for me, the bit. I've become like just such a YouTube junkie, Same. <laughs> uh, you know, like I just think there's something I, like you said, everybody kind of learns differently. And right. for me, it's been like this evolution of blogging was, you know, I, I used to love to read blogs and now I it's just not part of my workflow. Like I just typically don't read read that many blog posts. Uh, and I still listen to a fair amount of podcasts, but I don't have a commute anymore. Uh, and so I don't listen to them as much. But I do watch a ton of YouTube videos, whether it's shorts, whether I mean, you know, and YouTube's YouTube's smart enough to get get you in that sort of algorithm and they figure out what you like to watch and they're going to keep funny. serving you it up. Right. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's so much actionable, like practical advice. And I love being able to see it and see people talk about it. Right. Like that's helpful for me to learn this to go through and be like, oh, I see what they did there. That's how they're doing that. Um, I, You know, like. One of my favorites is Chris Doe over, you know, Chris the future. Doe, I say, yes. I, I, the I say future. it all the time, but like uh, so Chris good. Doe is so good. I, and honestly, so good. like even just reverse it for me, like reverse engineering uh, how he re how they repurpose their content and how mm. they distribute that content. See, like, yeah. just go look at Chris Doe and what they do with their podcast and how they get that stuff right. out there. You'll be in, you'll be inspired. It's so funny. Yeah. Chris Doe is so good. Uh, you know, he, he's big on Instagram, too, with like this mm -hmm. carousel stuff that he repurposes some of his content then he does his workshop uh so any other channels that you watch you said you binge um a bunch of other channels that um, might yeah, have been I mean, related yeah. to marketing at all just it's it, sometimes it's great to watch non-marketing stuff just to analyze how try to figure out how they're doing what they're doing uh so I'm yeah i watch i watch like two uh like i'm a huge like i love to cook and so i watch like a lot of cooking channels mm. like Joshua Weisman is like a huge right, yeah. YouTuber yeah. and um, there's a couple other ones that I watch there, but I like to kind of see, like you said, like that is interesting you bring that up because it's, it brings up, um, or like I used to, like I was really into like car videos for, I'm not even a car person, but I was really into like these car videos, like just watching people fix their cars and do different things. I was like, right. this is so fascinating, but it does give you ideas for content 
from time mm. to time to where you can be like, oh, I could, you know, they're bre- they're just breaking down X, Y, and Z thing. That's kind of cool. Like I could do that, like break down different pieces of content right. this way or break, d- you know, for, for whatever the business is. Um, I, I do get super inspired by, uh, by watching those, those different pieces of content. That's true. That makes sense. It's fascinating that you're talking about this YouTubers and it seemed like they're distributing their content a lot of them are distributing the content like already uh, really well mm-hmm. with shorts and then they probably haven't some of them have newsletter like Chris uh, same with like a uh, travel YouTuber that I follow Karen Nate um, it seems like video is such a good platform uh, cha- uh, medium to repurpose is that is that uh, an observation that makes sense or is like to- mm-hmm. totally off base no I think it makes a ton of sense it's one of the main reasons why I love podcasts honestly mm-hmm. like why like I'm serious when I say this, like if I was, if I was a company starting a content or rethinking their content strategy in 2023, I would start with a show or a podcast because I think there's so much value in video because you get, like you talked about earlier, I don't ever want to assume my audience has to consume my content in one way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. So by cutting that up into a million different ways, they can consume it however they want. They can listen to the podcast. They can read the newsletter. They can watch the YouTube video eventually. They can uh, follow me on different social media and they can get that same idea or that content cut up into a million different ways. And it's interesting. I'm going to have somebody on on my show, Distribution First, coming up. And we're going to actually talk about some of that with YouTube and with creators because I think creators are the perfect interesting the perfect um, place to look at how to properly distribute content because mm. they don't even think about it probably as like content distribution. They're just like, this is how I get, this is how I get my content out into the world. Like, you know, whereas marketers, it's like, oh, we have this thing and we call it, you know, distribution and we, ta- we tack it on at the end of our content strategy. And it's like creators, it's just what they do. They, they, right. w- they could not survive if they didn't yeah, get their content right. in front of the audience. Yeah. That's true, right? Because they're so dependent on the CPM that advertisers, where the more um, they distribute in different channels, the more they can charge, essentially. So yep. they're really thinking about how can I make as much money versus like sometimes um, B2B marketers are so t- stuck on, oh, let's just rank on this thing versus, uh, you know, let's get it's Facebook a, to close it. It's a different mentality of... Um, getting your audience onto your website versus just getting mm, eyeballs and getting attention. You right. know, I, th- I feel like that's a very different thing. Whereas right. like, like the creator doesn't really care necessarily. Maybe they care that they watch the long form video <laughs> for X, Y, and Z reasons, but like right. shorts and TikTok and all these other areas that they can, they can get that message out. Like you said, it's all about impressions. It's getting, you know, more eyeballs. It's getting, you know, we've all, seen in whatever your niche is that you enjoy following there's that person or that those few people where you're just like i see them everywhere now they're everywhere how are they doing that and it's by distribution it's by getting their content out in front of their audience all the time well i hope you are as inspired as i am to repurpose my content more after hearing my discussion with justin you can learn more about justin's work with his podcast distributionfirst.co as well as his work at justinsimon.com. All of those links are in the show notes and description below. Thank you to Justin for being on the show. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power-Ups newsletter. I share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the three best frameworks that top marketers use to hit their KPIs consistently and wow their colleagues. I wanna say thank you to you for listening and Please like and follow Marketing Power Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you feel like extra generous, kind of leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and leave a comment on YouTube. It goes a long way in others finding out about Marketing Power Ups. Thanks to Mary Saladin for creating the artwork and design. And thank you to Faisal Kaigo for editing the intro video. And of course, thank you for listening. That's all for now. Have a powered up day. <laughs>